Hi, I'm Brett Senkis with Brayton Woods. We're an M&A advisor, also called an investment banker, or business broker, and uh, I run Senkis Law, which is a business law firm. We do a lot of M&A, a lot of securities compliance, a lot of contract work, a little bit of dispute work. If you uh, are into M&A, mergers and acquisitions, head on over to merger-resources.com. That site, uh, it's my site. There's lots of free resources, all the videos I post, all the articles I put out in the world, checklists, diagrams, case studies, you know, just about anything you want. We're constantly updating it. It's all free all the time. Today, I want to talk about a headline that I saw. And uh, today's April 28th, 2020. When I'm doing this video, it will be relevant, I think, to even regardless of probably where this, uh, what I'm going to talk about ends up going and what ends up happening with it. But it caught my attention that Elizabeth Warren, who is a senator from Massachusetts, uh, she recently ran for the Democratic nomination uh, for the U.S. President, and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is a representative, U.S. House of Representatives from New York, have introduced a bill called the Pandemic Anti-Monopoly Act. So basically what they're trying to do is freeze mergers and acquisitions activity during this corona virus, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. And there appear to be two main justifications. Well, first of all, what they want to do is is there's be a presumption, I guess it's possible these could still maybe go through, but there would be a, a, a presumption that they should not happen and maybe just a, a flat out prohibition, I don't really understand, on M&A activity, um, I think the former, I think you could probably still get them through, it'd just be a lot more work and it'd just be a lot easier for regulators to say this shouldn't happen. And it's for any M&A any activity involving companies who have, as I understand it, revenue, I believe, above $100 million or financial institutions with market caps or just general like values in the market above $100 million. Anything involving private equity and hedge funds, uh, any M&A involving like a patent that has relevance or is, is particularly uh, useful or rele um, valuable for fighting in the, a coronavirus. So. It's a pretty broad bill. It wouldn't apply to small business or Main Street or the lower middle market, but well, it could, I guess, with the patents and anything involving private equity. So it's a pretty broad reaching bill to stop M&A activity. The justifications for the bill appear to be twofold. One is that these companies who are acquiring other companies right now, who are the buyers in the M&A process, ought to be using their money uh, to help their employees and just generally to sort of spread the wealth. That's, that's number one. The second one is that um, the private equity funds, the hedge funds, the large tech companies, the ones who are acquiring right now are acting like vultures and they're scooping up distressed companies in their time of need. Both of these justifications are, I, I don't see any validity to either of them. And by the way, I like Elizabeth Warren. I mean, she taught at my law school. I, I, I think she has a lot of good things to say. I mean, I don't want to align perfectly with every viewpoint she has, but I'm, I'm certainly not you know, 180 degrees in the other direction for Elizabeth Warren. I think she's on some good things in terms of trying to take power away from Wall Street and, and, uh, and the issue of monopolies and things like that, it, just generally speaking. But on this one, you know, I just don't see it. So the first is that, that these companies, should, instead of acquiring the companies, they ought to be using their money to help their employees. That's number one. Well, first of all, the government has never told us how to use our money, right? It, it does use tax. Um, it uses tax, vice taxes on cigarettes and things to try and drive behavior. Uh, there's no question that government is trying to, to do that and to regulate behavior in, in certain ways, and they use tax and money to do it. But they, they've never, you know, aside from saying you can't buy something, I mean, it's just, I can't think of any examples where the government has said, you're not allowed to go invest in that or do this or you know, something that otherwise is legal, right? Um, that's a bit, it's a bit odd. That's number one. It seems unprecedented for the government to take that step to just start telling companies how they're supposed to use their money to grow their businesses. Number two, it isn't actually driving the spending that Warren and Ocasio-Cortez want, which is spending money on employees. So if you tell a company you can't go acquire another company, it doesn't mean they're going to turn around and just give loans and bonuses to their employees, right? I mean, why would that be the case? I mean, it's kind of like me, or if, if a father wants his son to clean his room, and uh, son says, you know, I'm going to go outside and play. Dad says, no, you can't go outside and play. And that's it. And then just secretly hopes the son will sit around, you know, and start cleaning his room. That doesn't make any sense, right? If anything, I think the son is probably going to sit there stewing, 
<clears throat> excuse me, stewing and not interested in doing something that you know dad might want. Now, if you said you can't do that unless you clean your room, okay, you know, I'm not sure that is the best approach all the time or would be a great one with this 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 legislation, but but okay, maybe, but just saying you can't go spend your money that way or son or daughter, you can't go outside and play and hope that they then do what you want doesn't make a lot of sense. The third concern or issue I have with this first justification that we, the companies who are doing, who are acquiring M&A buyers, buyers in the M&A market should be using their money to help the employees is that M&A activity generally is pro-growth. It, it's, it's helpful. Companies are growing. They are helping their employees by growing. Uh, there is absolutely, at the individual level, friction and uh, pain. Some employees can lose their jobs in the M&A process, but there's no question overall. I mean, economists will tell you it's pro-growth. It's good for society. I'm not saying there should be zero restrictions on it at all. Uh, I'm not saying that people losing their jobs, that there isn't pain to that, that isn't unfortunate. That, but the idea that this activity is not helping the economy is just, it's, it's wrong. I mean, it, it, it is. Um, <clears throat> even in the case where it's buying distressed assets, it's likely to put those assets to work rather than having them be distressed and unused or something. Or companies that are in bankruptcy that aren't operating, they're liquidating, now you're getting the assets back to, to you. So this idea is it, just fundamentally misguided that the process is not pro-growth and helping people all together. Um, and the money that's used to pay the company that you're acquiring, that money gets distributed in some manner too. So it's helpful on that side of the ledger. The other justification that, hey, these poor companies that are in their time of need, struggling to survive, and now here come these vultures, these private equity funds and big tech to, to take them over, is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. Like, it, 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 I assume it's premised on the idea that there's a lot of hostile takeover activity. I don't even know. I mean, there really isn't a hostile takeover of a private company. I mean, that just doesn't exist. I mean, you, you could try and sneak in and talk to a shareholder and get a bunch of them to agree to sell you their stock, but like, it doesn't happen. And there's so many restrictions on selling private stock and requirements and almost every deal we ever do where we represent the issue or the company you know, selling stock, we require the holders tell us there's rights of first refusal, they gotta bring us the deal first. It's like, that doesn't happen in the private company context. In the public company context, it also is exceedingly rare. You hear about attempts, but they don't go through. And the reason is because in the 80s, to, to prevent this kind of activity. It was the era of a lot of hostile takeover activity. And there was a big backlash and boards, it's, it's controversial from a corporate law standpoint, but boards would put in place these structures to avoid hostile takeovers. It's controversial because even though the soundbite is that a hostile takeover is so painful and all these people lose their jobs, and some of the corporate raiders were absolutely cutthroat and dismantled all sorts of operations, and there was a lot of pain at the individual you know, even full cities and local levels from the way that things were being done. But but boards now put in place these mechanisms to prevent those hostile takeovers, and that's not necessarily good. That can often be very self-serving. The board of directors and the officers don't want anyone taking them over, even if the, t the, the company doing the hostile takeover, executing it, is um, would be a better operator of the business, right? So, so there are tools that corporate boards put into place to prevent this kind of activity. One is called the poison pill, which essentially says if an acquirer, a hostile acquirer, uh, accumulates a certain amount of stock, all the other shareholders are either given shares or have the opportunity to buy shares at a discount. It's effectively like, it, it, it's kind of a crazy tool, but it exists. I don't know that it's ever been challenged. It seems like there's a it's just like a property right problem with the whole thing, but that's another story. It, it is a tool and it exists. Another are staggered boards. It's hard to take over the board because uh, most public companies, if they have nine uh, directors on their board, only three come up for uh, election every year. And then the next year, the, another three, and the year after another three. So there's these tools that prevent hostile takeover. So it's like, that's not a lot of what's going on in the world at all. So because there's not a lot of hostile takeover activity, right? by definition, if it's not hostile, it's uh, agreed. The companies who are being acquired want to do the deal. So this poor company, oh my gosh, they're fighting for survival. Well, if they have other options, they don't have to take the deal that's being offered to them. No one has a gun to their head. This isn't hostile. 
right? They agree to do it because it's the best deal for them today. So all you're doing is taking away an option. Uh, that doesn't make sense in this context. Companies will go out of business, will fail because they can't continue. And if you take away their M&A exit, you know, it doesn't, that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, now, maybe if this whole program, if Warren and um, uh, Ocasio-Cortez were doing a, a program where if you had a term sheet from an acquirer, right, on the table or a letter of intent or something, the government would give a special one-time independence loan, right? So you could agree to take this loan and not sell out. No, hey, maybe. I mean, I'm not so sure. I mean, that would make some sense at least. I mean, because it would be, you'd not be taking away options, you'd be adding options. So I don't know how in a, in a world where, where, uh, again, there's no gun to the head, there's no hostile takeover, the company being acquired wants to sell. They want to sell for a reason. In this environment, you would take away that option. doesn't make any sense. And fundamentally, you're taking away activity. And right now, in uh, what we're going into, in, uh, just um, we're in unprecedented times, and who knows what's ahead. There's a lot of stimulus activity from the government, but we might be going into a deep recession. Who knows, right? We don't know where this is going to go, but definitely unemployment is sky high. The economy is contracting. If you want to, uh, you, if you want to keep the economy going, you've got to keep activity going. That's fundamentally what keeps things going: circulating money and activity. And M&A activity does that. So taking that just taking that out of the equation doesn't make sense. It's going to take away a big slug of economic activity, again, that the acquiring, the company being acquired wants, all in the hope that the company who is going to do the acquiring just decides to just give the money to their employees. And so to me, the Pandemic Anti-Monopoly Act uh, seems like a misguided, almost perverse attempt to co-opt a crisis moment to advance a broader agenda. And that's what politicians do. I'm disappointed. I, I, I like Elizabeth Warren for the most part, and, I, and I, I, like, I like her, and I like her policies for the most part, or a lot of what her agenda is, I should say. I, I think is, it has always appeared to me to be uh, rightly or uh, good-spirited and well-intended. I mean, regardless of what you think, I'm, I'm really just disappointed because this one seems like just an opportunity to advance an agenda, and it, it, it's going to do clearly more harm than good to me. It, it, it just doesn't make it any sense. If you agree with that, let me know. If you disagree, let me know. Drop a line. If you like this video, subscribe. If you love M&A content and you like what I have to say, head over to merger-resources.com. I appreciate you tuning in today. Thanks.